Hello, History One students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have your notes for Chapter 16, Section 3, A Bloody Conflict. And as we're going through this section, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the weaponry. We're going to talk a little bit about the U.S. arrival into Europe uh, during the war. And we're going to talk about the end of the war, particularly the um, Treaty of Versailles and some of the items that go along with that. So, as we go along here, you will have a supplement that you'll be using. Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about combat in World War I. And even before the United States was involved in this war, it was a really gruesome conflict. So in Roman numeral I, combat in World War I, how did soldiers protect themselves from powerful artillery fire during this war? And part of that was uh, the fact that artillery uh, really killed more people than any other weapons during the war itself, uh, compared to like the time of the Civil War when the artillery literally was uh, very close to the infantry. I mean, as far as uh, probably within yards of where our infantry were, were set up. It, by the time we get to World War I, the guns are much, much larger. In many cases, uh, the artillery guns were placed several miles behind the front lines. So what did soldiers do? For the most part, they ended up digging trenches. And these trenches became highly fortified. Uh, a lot of barbed wire, obstacles. In some cases, uh, the trenches themselves were fortified with steel and concrete. Uh, whatever they could to keep themselves out of harm's way. Um, as far as the trench systems themselves, literally there were trenches that ran uh, across parts of Europe from the English Channel all the way to the Swiss border. And that space in between those trenches was known as no man's land. And that's where you're going to find these fortifications with barbed wire and other obstacles. Uh, what other dangers did troops behind the trenches face? A lot of it has to do with the weaponry. Um, many of our soldiers uh, were arming themselves with grenades, which are literally smaller bombs, uh, fixed bayonets with their guns, uh, rifles primarily, pistols if they had them, other kind of hand weapons. In some cases, it, it came down to whatever you could find, rocks, knives, your fist, whatever was going to do the, the job whenever you were in a situation where you're kind of like eye to eye with your enemy. Uh, why did both sides begin developing new technology? Part of it has to do with the fact that the war itself had kind of like really become stagnated and we needed to find ways to break through the enemy lines. So with that, um, some of the newer technologies that come out of this war, first one I want to talk about is, is the, the Zeppelins, which were rigid balloons uh, for the most part, developed by the Germans, uh, they were used in combat, uh, kind of the kind of a one-time only deal. Uh, they were used to drop bombs over the North Sea and the English Channel. Uh, for the most part, uh, they were slow, and uh, they made themselves very easy targets. Uh, but needless to say, they uh, they kind of opened the door to what's going to happen as far as um, moving the war from the ground to the sky. Uh, in letter D, uh, one of the new technologies that was very much feared uh, was um, introduced by the Germans in the Battle of the Second Battle of Euripides, and that was poisonous gas. Uh, originally, the, the poisonous gas might have induced vomiting for the most part, making soldiers very nauseous if they came in contact. But as the war progresses and as both sides start using it as a weapon, uh, you're going to find that they're using forms of gas that lead to blindness of our soldiers. You can kind of see that in the, the picture there in the middle of your screen. Uh, but along with that, you were going to find uh, gas that eventually would lead to suffocation. And in many cases, um, individuals who had been exposed to that kind of gas uh, literally would just start coughing to the point where they would cough up parts of their lungs. Uh, it was very vicious as far as a way to die. And as a result of that, we're going to have to introduce things like gas mask. And it's not only going to be for uh, humans, but if you had, like, let's say horses that were involved in um, 
bringing supplies up to the front. Uh, even horses were outfitted uh, with gas masks along with dogs and such. Uh, military vehicles that were introduced during the war, uh, tanks primarily by the British. Uh, the tanks for the most part were kind of developed as a way to kind of break through the, the trench system. Uh, they were slow. In some cases, they were kind of unreliable as far as um, working the tracks and, and such. Uh, one of the things that we do know is that in no man's land, occasionally there were landmines. Um, the steel that uh, was used in these early tanks was not necessarily very thick. And uh, in many cases, it could be pierced very easily by um, by some of the bullets and, and other types of weapons. So for the most part, um, didn't necessarily make a huge difference as far as tank usage, but it provided us an opportunity to kind of find a way to perfect it. And by the time we get to World War II, tanks have replaced the, the cavalry. You know, if you think about the cavalry in, in terms of horses and such, uh, by the time we get to World War II, those have been retired and tanks have taken their place. Airplanes were also used in this war initially for scouting uh, to kind of figure out uh, where maybe artillery and troops were located. Eventually, they would be mounted with uh, machine guns, uh, in some cases, even small rockets, and eventually smaller bombs. And again, they became very lethal, but a pilot that was flying with, a, like, for example, the Army Air Corps for the United States, literally had a life expectancy in weeks. Um, so it was a very dangerous job, but at the same time, it's going to start changing the course of warfare for the future. Uh, the United States in Roman numeral two, we get involved in this war. And I mentioned the other day that we didn't declare war until April of 1917. Between the time the war begins for the United States and the time that the armistice is signed in November of 1918, Roughly 2 million American soldiers are going to be fighting in this conflict. Um, our soldiers are nicknamed Doughboys. And part of that was um, just kind of by the looks of their uniforms. But the truth is our soldiers were incredibly inexperienced compared to that of the Europeans. Uh, but for the most part, we were a huge morale boost uh, for the Allies uh, and that, in a way, uh, kind of starts changing the course of the war. So let's talk a little bit about your items here. Letter A, who was responsible for preventing any American ships from being sunk on their way to Europe? And that was Admiral William Sims. Uh, Sims had been kind of following what was going on with the British and the French as far as their fleets and the fact that they were being easily targeted by German U-boats. And to prevent some of our ships from being sunk, he decided to uh, implement a convoy system that would be, for the most part, uh, made up of merchant ships, troop ships, and naval ships. So for the most part, we could bring supplies, we could bring men, but they would also be ex uh, escorted by uh, naval destroyers, which are smaller ships than battleships. Uh, they're highly maneuverable, they're, they're well-armed, and for the most part, because of the fact that they were traveling in a convoy, if a ship would be targeted, uh, there would be other ships coming. And so for the most part, those uh, people on those ships could be easily rescued. For the most part, reducing uh, the loss of lives, uh, which makes Sims kind of a hero in this case. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Russia and letter B. Uh, what was Vladimir Lenin's first act after seizing power in Russia in 1917? Lenin, just so you know, he was a Bolshevik, uh, basically a follower of communism. And one of the things that they did um, when they took over the government in Russia was to pull Russia out of the war, out of World War One. And in March of 1918, uh, the Germans and the Russians actually signed the Treaty of brest uh, Litovsk, uh, which basically uh, ended the war for Russia. Uh, what Russia did is it would um, hand over the Ukraine and Poland, the Baltic territories, and also Finland. And Russia, for the most part, could withdraw its troops and concentrate on the war on the Western Front. 
So that kind of leads us to some issues here. And I want to talk a little bit about how our U.S. troops kind of enter combat. And I kind of want to talk a little bit about a, a little folklore here. Um, in the spring of 1917, the United States gets itself involved in war. By July, uh, American troops were starting to arrive in Europe, uh, being led by John J. Pershing, General Pershing, who was in charge of the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, they arrived in Paris on July 4th, 1917. And the story goes is that one of the, the things that Pershing and some of his um, officers wanted to do is to pay respect to the Marquis de Lafayette. And if you've um, ever watched or listened to the musical Hamilton, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette um, kind of goes back to the days of the American Revolution. Uh, he was a, a French uh, citizen who strongly allied himself with the American cause, the cause of the colonists during the Revolutionary War. And matter of fact, uh, it was the, the Marquis de Lafayette who helped train uh, many of our troops during this war itself. And so during this, this, uh, this visit, uh, the story goes, Colonel Charles Stanton, uh, who happened to be uh, one of Pershing's um, colonels, one of his officers, uh, as they visit the grave side of Lafayette, he yells out, Lafayette, we are here. And in a way, it kind of inspires our soldiers uh, maybe to pay uh, some respect to what the French did for us in our Revolutionary War. In a way, uh, we were kind of paying back that debt. Along with that, um, John J. Pershing was also asked by the French and the British if uh, our troops, the American troops, would allow themselves to be integrated in with the British and French forces. And General Pershing flatly refused to allow that to happen. He did not want American troops fighting under British and French commanders. What he wanted was American troops fighting under American commanders, except for one group of men. And uh, that's our next item here, if we can get to it. There we go. Uh, which American unit was transferred to the French and became the first Americans to enter combat during World War I? And that was the 93rd Infantry Division. They were an all African-American unit. Uh, they were transferred to the French and became the first Americans to actually begin fighting in uh, the First World War. They were highly decorated uh, for their valor. In letter D, who organized the most massive attack in American history, which caused Germans to begin to retreat in September of 1918? And that would be our friend General John J. Pershing. Uh, Pershing uh, basically ordered this in the late September of 1918 uh, near the Argonne Forest. And roughly 600,000 American troops, along with about 40 uh, thousand tons of supply and about 4,000 artillery pieces uh, basically went on a massive attack of the Germans. Uh, this was probably one of the biggest um, attacks that was ever um, amassed by Americans. Uh, along with that, uh, what we found is that, you know, the German positions were going to uh, basically fall to Americans by November of 1918. Uh, for the most part, the United States had kind of um, shattered a lot of German defenses. Uh, we were able, uh, able to open up uh, kind of a hole in the, the German flank and begin our attack and kind of leading to the, the rapid end of the war. There were some heroes uh, on the American side. I want to talk just briefly about a guy named Eddie Rickenbacker. Eddie Rickenbacker was a former race car driver. Got to remember race cars in 1917, 1918. Not like race cars today. But he was um, a combat pilot with the 94th Aero Squadron, uh, one of the first uh, squadrons that were all American to enter combat. But he fought in 134 air battles, and he shot down... Uh, roughly 26 aircrafts, like your aces, if you want to call it that. But in one battle, he single-handedly battled seven German planes, and he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his valor. 
The other man I want to talk about is uh, listed right here in front of you. Uh, which American hero uh, who originally tried to avoid the draft as a conscientious ob objector uh, took command during the Battle of Argonne Forest, and that was a guy named Sergeant Alvin York. York, uh, because he was a Christian when he registered for the draft in 1917, on his card he um, put down conscientious objector because of his Christian beliefs, uh, but he didn't necessarily shun the opportunity to be drafted. And uh, he believed that he could fight in a war if the cause was just. Uh, he was from rural Tennessee. And a lot of the people that were in his neck of the woods were very poor. Uh, there weren't a lot of roads that, you know, went into this part of the country. So many of them had minimal education, but he certainly was an avid hunter. And on October the 8th, 1918, in this battle, uh, York's platoon was being fired upon by um, German machine guns. Uh, roughly nine men from York's platoon had died. York took command and he charged those machine gun nests, uh, killing anywhere between nine to roughly 25 Germans and capturing their guns. Some say that um, maybe the Germans thought that there were more troops coming. But in the end, he took 132 men prisoner and was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. He became a celebrity. Uh, matter of fact, Hollywood made a movie about this man. But for, um, for winning this honor and his recognition from Hollywood and, and his story, uh, he was able to make some money. And that money that he made, he used to help build schools in rural Tennessee. Uh, let's talk about the end of the war. Uh, a flawed peace. In uh, November of 1918, the war for the most part kind of came to an end. Um, by November, the beginning of November, the Ottoman Empire in Austria, Austria Hungary, uh, had surrendered to the Allies. And um, on the 3rd of November, there was mutiny starting in Germany. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated the throne. And uh, Germany became a republic. But on November 11th, 1918, we actually had this, this beginning of the armistice, uh, this agreement to stop fighting. And so according to the armistice, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, the fighting stopped. And hence, we've got to start talking about peace negotiations. So who were the principal figures in this post-war negotiation? They were the big four. Woodrow Wilson, David Lloyd George, who happened to be the prime minister of Great Britain, uh, George Clement Zhu, who was the premier of France, and a man named Vittorio um, Orlando, who was the prime minister of Italy. These are going to be the men who are going to forge out this agreement. And one of the things uh, that Wilson brought with him uh, to this negotiation was something that he had presented to Congress maybe a year before, um, basically his plan for peace, which included something called the 14 points. And the 14 points, for the most part, uh, called for the creation of a League of Nations to preserve peace. This idea that you would have uh, countries who would join together, who would, uh, for the most part, form an alliance, but also would uh, basically try to preserve peace at all price. Why did some allied leaders criticize Wilson's 14 points? Part of it was because they really wanted to punish Germany. Uh, Germany had been kind of a thug for many, many decades, and this was an opportunity for them to kind of get revenge. And so as our leaders met at Versailles, which is, um, if you remember, the palace of uh, Louis the 16th. Uh, they met starting in January of 1919 to about uh, June of 1919. And uh, they forged this agreement uh, known as the Treaty of Paris. And they did not invite the Russians uh, because they figured the Russians had already negotiated their own peace agreement. Um, and so they kept them out. At the same time, a lot of people were growing very weary of the Russians because of Vladimir Lenin's rise to power. There was civil war happening in, in Russia. Matter of fact, uh, the United States and Great Britain, along with Japan, had actually sent troops to Russia uh, to aid anti-communist forces. Matter of fact, uh, the United States sent 15,000 troops 
that stayed in Russia until 1920 when the Bolsheviks had actually won their civil war. So what happened to Germany under this Treaty of Versailles? Well, Germany, for the most part, was stripped of its armed forces. They had to pay reparations. They had to accept guilt for the outbreak of the war. And so what I want to do here is kind of use your supplemental part of your notes and talk a little bit about Wilson's 14 points. Um, 14 points for the most part. Um, any nation that signed this, there, there weren't going to be any secret treaties, no secret diplomacies. Uh, there would be freedom of the seas, meaning that ships could go on the sea without being targeted or sunk. Uh, there would be free trade among all nations, so no more tariffs. We would reduce our armed forces, so no more arms race. We're going to settle all colonial claims fairly, so not one nation becoming more powerful because they own more land. We're going to evacuate German troops from all German or from all Russia from Russia and restore all the conquered territory back to its rightful owners. We're going to restore Belgium's independence. We're going to restore all French territory occupied by the Germans, particularly Alsace Lorraine. Uh, we're going to adjust Italy's borders based on where the Italians lived. We're going to basically divide Austria Hungary into two new nations uh, based on their ethnic groups. Uh, we're going to base borders of the Balkan states on nationality. We're going to break up the Ottoman Empire and make Turkey a separate country. And we're going to create an independent Poland and create that League of Nations. So all that would be within that 14 points. So with the Treaty of Versailles, as far as things that it was going to do, uh, the Germans would return all their captured territory to Belgium, Russia, and France. Along with that, Germany would be divided in two. Some of the German territory would be given to Denmark, as you can see on the map, uh, France, just a little bit of that, Poland to the east, Czechoslovakia, and Belgium. Along with that, the Germans are going to be responsible for the wartime losses and pay reparations, and those would be very hefty. Uh, along with that, uh, Germany's army, army and navy would be limited in size, and Germany could not have an air force and could not have military forces west of the Rhine River. Thank you very much.